Let's take our Bibles, if you turn with me, uh, to Proverbs chapter number 6. The book of Proverbs chapter number 6. We have been on Wednesday evening studying through this book, and we come now to chapter 6. We're going to read verse 1 down to verse number 5. And uh, I want to encourage you to follow along as I read Proverbs chapter 6 and begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art in snare, or thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. I want to draw your attention to an expression we find twice here in our text. The first time it is found in verse 3. Notice uh, the Bible says, Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. And then again repeating in verse 5 the first two words, Deliver thyself. I want to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you this evening, and as we come to your word, we pray that you would give us understanding. Uh, may you guide our thinking this evening, help us to think uh, biblically, and help us to understand uh, the truth that is being communicated in this passage. Uh, Lord, help us not just to uh, be knowledgeable about your word, but Lord, help us to adjust our thinking and adjust our lives in accordance to your word. And for that, we need your help and your transforming power. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, it is important to understand as we come to the book of Proverbs that it is the wisdom of God for everyday life. And there's a lot of practical wisdom. And this, in our passage, is one of those this evening. A person living by the wisdom is not saved. That's important to understand. Uh, by merely conforming to the practical instruction that are written therein. However, it is clear that even the unregenerate man who seeks to order his life in accordance to this book will save himself from many failures and needless losses. I think we can pretty uh, declare that, that to live by the wisdom of this book, even an unregenerate man will save uh, his life from many heartache and failure although living by this book does not save a man. Now, in Proverbs chapter number 5, we find that the son is warned about being deceived by the stranger and being entrapped by covetousness. Now, in Proverbs 6, the son is warned about the dangers of being trapped by commitment made to his friends. In other words, there are two different things, but in both we see a language of entrapment, of being captured. Uh, in chapter 5, being deceived uh, by the strange woman and her philosophy and being entrapped by covetousness, but here really is being entrapped by yourself and your own thinking and your own behavior. Uh, this is certainly an important truth as we consider our text from verse 1 to verse number 5. There are many dangers in this life and they do not all come from the evil man and the strange woman. Uh, we must realize that there are dangers that come from within ourselves in our dealing, particularly with family and with friends. And God gives us wisdom here in how to deal with one aspect of our relationship with our friends. It is certain that we can be deceived and lured into sin, but it is also certain that we can be deceived by our own lack of understanding and thereby become entrapped by our unhealthy decisions. Uh, this often happens because of a failure to consider the long-term consequences of such unhealthy decision. Now, as we consider this passage, we are not addressing, now it's important, some evil behavior on the surface. Uh, it is not the description of a man here who is trying to rob another. That's not the description of our text. Nor is it a man who is trying to hurt another man. As a matter of fact, when you read the text, it's a man trying to help another man. But yet in that attempt, he's actually doing the wrong thing. This passage is a warning 
about how your decisions can bring much hurt and harm to your life. Now we would say, when we read in verse, uh, in this very chapter, verse 10 through uh, verse uh, uh, 6, when he talks about, go to the end, thou slugger, consider her ways, and be wise. Now we would say that the slugger is not hurting anyone else, right? He's not uh, hurting you, he's not hurting his neighbor. However, we understand that he is indeed hurting himself by his laziness. He's not preparing himself. This is what it, we are addressing here when we come to the first part of chapter number 6. It is not this idea of hurting somebody else, but it's by your own decision you are hurting yourself. Now, the title we consider in our study is, is this, and we uh, consider the words repeated twice, Deliver Thyself. But the title this evening is this, Deliver Thyself from Unhealthy Commitments. Deliver Thyself. From unhealthy commitments, or a second title we could apply to the message this evening is entrapped by unhealthy commitments. Now I want us to consider as we come to our text, uh, the word friend is repeated uh, throughout our text. So we know we're dealing with a relationship issue uh, as we come to our text this evening. I want us to consider three points uh, this evening, as we look at our text from Proverbs 6, verse 1 through 5, first of all, we see the caution on hasty commitments. The caution on hasty commitments. Notice here, verse 1 and 2, and this is uh, the warning that is given to my son. Notice, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thine hand, thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Now, I want you to notice important here, in verse number 2, he basically says, if you do this, this is what's happened to you, as a matter of fact. You've been ensnared, and you've been taken, if you do what verse 1 says uh, that you're not supposed to do. Now, the general caution and admonition of these verses is on a man's words, but particularly on a man's commitment. Uh, words of commitment. It is clear in our text that this commitment is one done out of haste without much consideration beforehand. Uh, that's clear as we look at the language of those verses. The godly man is the man we know, according to Proverbs as we've already looked, a man who orders his steps. It is a man who ponders the path and he thinks ahead. We've already established that's a man who has wisdom. A man of wisdom is greatly concerned not just about his decisions, but about the consequences of his decisions, and not just the seeming goodness of his decisions, but the consequences of those decisions. That's what a wise man does. Uh, we've emphasized a lot about choosing wisdom. Choosing wisdom, but also part of wisdom and being a wise man is to consider before the decision is made about where the decision is going to bring you. You see, it is possible to make a decision that would be deemed by many as compassionate and right and loving at the first, but can soon be examined as detrimental in the long term. So the caution on hasty commitments, I want you to notice first of all, as we examine the first verse, the comprehension of the caution. What, how, how do we understand verse number one? Notice again, my son, if thou be surety for, for thy friend... If thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. What does that mean? Uh, I think that in many years of reading through the book of Proverbs, I, I, I no doubt glossed over those verses many times without trying to pause and understand what actually that verse means. So let's understand this verse. The word surety here literally means this. It literally means to braid, to intermix. Okay? That's what the word surety literally means. It is applied in this sense. It means to give yourself to, uh, to be a security for, uh, to mortgage yourself. It means to give a pledge to someone or to meddle yourself in the affairs of another. Uh, so that's the implication of that word, to be surety to thy friend. It is a reference to a monetary commitment on behalf of someone else 
who cannot pay their debt themselves. This is the man who basically braids himself to another man, intermingles himself with another man, intermixes his life uh, to the life of another man. Now there are, I want to go to two references that we find in the Old Testament uh, so that we, we have an understanding of the, the, this word surety. I want us to go back to Genesis chapter number 43. And in Genesis chapter number 43, we know that uh, uh, Jacob and his sons are going through the famine. Joseph at that moment is in Egypt. They're talking about going back to Egypt. And uh, we know that Jacob basically told Judah, I'm not going to send my son Benjamin because I can't live without him. And so Judah basically didn't go, but now the pressure mounts. The famine begins to be very sore in the land. And so Judah, again, appeals to his father about returning back to Egypt with his brother Benjamin because he said, uh, the man that we talked to said that we're not going to be received unless we bring our younger brother. And so in Genesis 43, notice what Judah says to his father in verse number 8. The Bible says, And Judah said unto Israel, that's Jacob, his father, Send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and thou, and also our little ones. I will be, here it is, surety for him. Okay, Jacob says, I will be surety for him. So Jacob, in essence, was willing to mortgage himself, he was willing to give himself as a security for, he was willing to give himself as a pledge that his brother would return. He said, he said in verse 9, again, I will be surety for him of my hand. Shalt thou require him if I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. Now let's fast forward again to, or I guess, Go a little further in Genesis 44, and notice in verse number 30, now when uh, Joseph basically put the cup in the basket of Benjamin, and Benjamin is caught with that cup, obviously he didn't do it, but that was all planned out uh, by Joseph, and so Judah recognizes now that Benjamin is going to be taken into custody, and he's going to serve Joseph, and so now Judah intervenes for his brother, and notice in verse number 30 of Genesis chapter number 44, he says this, Now therefore, when I come to thy servant my father, and the lad be not with us, seeing that his life Life is bound up in the lad's life. Now he's arguing here with Joseph and saying basically, uh, please let me go instead of, of, of Benjamin. It shall come to pass when he seeth that the lad is not with, with us, that he will die. And thy servant shall bring down the gray hairs of thy servant our father with sorrow to the grave. For thy servant became surety for the lad unto my father. You see here Jacob uh, or Judah speaks of himself and he says, I became a surety. I pledged myself. I mortgaged myself on the behalf of Jacob. And so what does he do? He basically says, take me instead of Benjamin. So you see, he made a pledge. He was made himself a surety for Benjamin. So in the sense, that is uh, one example in which we find it in the Bible, in the Old Testament, how this word is used. And so to be surety for Benjamin meant that Judah was willing to pay his brother's debt so that Benjamin could go back to his father. There's one more example I'd like to consider, and that is in the book of Nehemiah, chapter number 5. In Nehemiah, chapter number 5 here, uh, we find that uh, the, there was a lot of uh, struggle going on with uh, uh, the people of Israel uh, in the land. And notice here w uh, what, it, what was going on. Basically, as many of, uh, of the uh, children of Israel owed debt and had to pay tribute to the king, notice in Nehemiah 5, verse 1. And there was a great cry of the people uh, of their wives against their brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, We our sons and our daughters are many, therefore we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, We have mortgaged our lands. Now the word mortgage is the same word that is used for the word surety. And so again it is used here in that context. We have mortgaged our land our vineyards and houses, and we might buy corn and cause the, uh, because of the dearth. There were also that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute, and that upon our lands and vineyards, yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren, our children as their children, and lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants, 
Uh, and some of our daughters are brought unto bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them, for other men have our lands and our vineyards. And so basically, during that time, the children of Israel were saying uh, to Nehemiah, you don't understand, we don't have anything. Uh, we, when we had money, we, uh, we gave that money. When we didn't have any more money, we gave our lands, we gave our vineyards. And when we didn't have anything, we said, well, let our children work for you. In other words, they, had, they mortgaged themselves. They had to pay debt. They even borrowed to pay tribute. So they mortgaged themselves. They made a pledge, but they mortgaged it out because they could not themselves pay for it. So with that in mind, when we come back to Proverbs chapter 6, and we read the verse, My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with the stranger. So you find here, my son, he says, if thou be surety, if you mortgage yourself for your friend or make a pledge on behalf of your friend. In other words, the, the idea here is you have a friend, he owes a debt, he cannot pay it, but you basically raise your hand up and says, I'll pay it for my friend. And then he goes on to say, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger. Now he goes on further and explains here what we're talking about. The expression "strick in thy hand is a natural symbol of the promise to keep one's word as a contract. And so basically he says, look, your friend owes a stranger a debt. And because you care for your friend, you're going to pledge yourself, you're going to mortgage yourself. Say, look, if my friend can pay the debt, I will pay it for him. And you basically strike the hand with a stranger on behalf of your friend. Now, your friend is not the only one who has a debt. Now, you've joined your friend into that debt with a stranger. So, that's what the first verse is talking about here. Now, both the expressions are actually found several times in the book of Proverbs. Let's go there. In Proverbs chapter number 17. I want you to notice here, Proverbs 17 verse 18. We find the same truth uh, explained here, Proverbs 17, 18. Notice, a man void of understanding striketh hands and becometh surety in the presence of his friend. So there it is, that same truth. Now, but here he says, basically says that it is a man void of understanding who does that. So that sheds a little bit of light. If you go to chapter number 22, in the Proverbs 22, notice verse number 26 and 27. The Bible says here, Be not thou one of them that strike hands, or of them that are sureties for debts. Okay, so there it is. That truth is explained several times in the book of Proverbs, and we have an idea uh, that this it is, it is not a good thing to do. So, the warning about being surety for a friend and striking your hand with a stranger is clear. Do not engage yourself in a commitment with a stranger on behalf of a friend. Never put yourself in a position that will put you in a place where you must pay the debt of a friend who will not follow through on their word. Now, let me give an illustration. Uh, back at, uh, Things have changed, but in recent history, it was not too long ago that bank managers assessed the finances of individuals as worthy recipients of various types of loans, whether it was a car loan or a house loan, managers would take it upon themselves to see, okay, these are your assets, this is how much money you have in the bank, and as a rule, a bank would only loan money to a person who had money. Now that was not recently, but not too far away. They would, again, they would loan money to people who had money, okay? When the banker, were, bankers were forced to decline a loan, the managers would often ask the following question to the loan applicant. Do you know anyone who would co-sign the note for you. The manager wanted to give the loan, but he also wanted the security of the loan being paid in full as he talks to his supervisors because he wanted a surety on the loan. Now the solution was for the customer to find a co-signer who would guarantee the loan. Therefore, if the customer defaulted on the loan, the co-signer who already had the funds would be paying the loan. In other words, he already had the funds. See, that was surety. It made the loan, if you would, secure or sure. The co-signer's signature made him the guarantor of the loan. So the loan was guaranteed. Now, the current loan practices are quite different today. 
Today, it is a little different. Bankers do not consider assets of a co-signer, uh, uh, but they simply uh, consider their credit worthiness. Or we could say their credit score. Their credit score shows them that they are capable of paying debt, not necessarily the evidence that they have money. Okay, so it is a little different how things function today. But this co-signing business, uh, we know and understand, has ruined many relationships, many families, and many friendship over the years. Why? Because someone co-signs on the loan, and then your friend doesn't pay the loan, and then you have to pay the loan. Now, God, in his wisdom, tells us that's not a good thing to do. Now, it would do us well to heed this warning in our present day, but we must dig a little deeper than just the principle being taught. I want us to examine for just a moment because we have to look below the surface here. We understand what this truth is in verse number 1. We understand what, God, what the warning is from the Lord. But I want us to consider, secondly, not only the comprehension of the caution, but number 2, the cause of the caution. Why? That's the question we have to ask. Why? We must ask ourselves this question before we go any further. Why do men often make haste to be a surety for their friend? In other words, to mortgage themselves to make a pledge for the debt of another man. What causes men to be surety for their friends? What causes men to strike his hand with a stranger for a friend? Now, I believe that there are two main culprits that causes such a hasty commitment which can be Identified, I believe, in our text. First of all, the first culprit is this. The presence of pride. Now, you all of a sudden say, well, wait a minute. Someone who's willing to guarantee themselves for somebody else's loan, you're saying they're prideful? That's exactly what I'm saying. And I'll explain it. The Bible says here, my, friend, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, and so we find here, I believe, that uh, the culprit number one uh, for someone that, that, that is caused to go ahead and be a surety for their friend is the presence of pride. You see, pride is generally the root cause for a man being a surety for a friend. This comes, and here it is, from a desire to be thought well of by your friends or thought well of in the world by strangers. It is the man who is more interested in being perceived well by others than he is in being perceived in the sight of God. Now, let me explain. Throughout the book of Proverbs, we find that to be true. For example, in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 25, the Bible says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. Well, that's interesting. The snare is the same word that is used talking about the man who engages in such a behavior. He is snared. The fear of man brings a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. You see, this is the man who is more interested in what man thinks of him than he is in what God thinks of him, and that is pride. He is interested in how he can be perceived by those friends and by the strangers than he is in doing the right thing. Now consider what this book teaches about what pride does in our lives. Proverbs 11 verse 2 tells us, When pride cometh, then cometh shame. The Bible's in Proverbs 13 10, Only by pride cometh contention. Proverbs 16 verse 18, Pride goeth before destruction. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 23, A man's pride shall bring him Low. In other words, when we make our decision based upon self-interest and self-desire because of what, how we want to be perceived by others around us, then that same pride will bring us low. That same pride will cause contention in a friendship. That same pride will cause shame. You see, pride is often the root cause of what brings us to make seeming helpful commitments which turn to be many times unhealthy commitments. This is the man who is compassionate not because it is right but because he desires to be perceived as compassionate. Do we understand the difference? This is not the man who is compassionate. He is compassionate not because it is right 
but because he wants to be perceived as compassionate. Now, the decisions he makes are not led by righteousness. Rather, the decision he makes are led by his pride. Consider what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 6, verse... Let's turn there and look at the words of Jesus Christ himself. I believe this truth was taught by our Lord when he said in Matthew chapter number 6, in Matthew chapter number 6, notice verse 3 through 6, the Bible says... But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You see, Jesus Christ here tells us that they do good things, do they not? They gave their alms. They pray. Now, we would call those things good things, are they not? But they do it to be seen of men. They're motivated by how they're perceived more than they're motivated by righteousness. You see, their good action is rooted in pride. And there it is. It is possible for us to do the right thing, but for it to be rooted in pride. You see, they are not led by righteousness, rather they are led by pride. A compassionate action, a compassionate action does not necessarily mean a compassionate heart. A compassionate action often does mean a prideful heart. Now I'm just presenting that as a culprit. But there's another culprit, and this is perhaps just as prevalent, prevalent as the first one. Not only do we see here the first culprit to be the presence of pride, but secondly, the second culprit is this, it is the absence of prudence. In other words, the first term is, notice, uh, that uh, the Bible tells us here that we are to not be a surety of thy friend, and then stri stricken thy hand with a stranger. And the whole idea of our text is to do something so quickly that you really don't uh, recognize what you're doing. Although pride is certainly a culprit, we must not neglect the possible second culprit that is also more common than we think, the absence of prudence. Now let me define prudence. According to Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, uh, this is the... Uh, definition of prudence. Wisdom applied to practice. Prudence implies caution in deliberating and consulting on the most suitable means to accomplish valuable purposes and to exercise sagacity in discerning and selecting them. Prudence differs from wisdom in this, that prudence implies more caution and reserve than wisdom, or in exercises more in foreseeing and avoiding evil than in devising and executing that which is good. It is sometimes mere caution or circumspection. So when we think about prudence, we have to think about someone who walks cautiously and someone who walks circumspectly. And always the idea of you see a friend in need, and all of a sudden you said out of, a, out of your good heart perhaps, you say, oh, well, I'll take care of this for you. That's a lack of prudence. You're not thinking before you're making the decision. You're just making a decision without considering where that path will lead. Now, the Bible also says much about prudence, not only about pride, but about prudence. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter number 8, verse 12, I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. <laughs> wisdom actually dwells with prudence. So, the one who is cautious, the one who is circumspect and who thinks before him, before he makes the decision, is actually an illustration of what wisdom is. Proverbs 13, 16 tells us, Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge. In other words, the prudent man stops and he pauses and he thinks about where decisions are going to lead. He works with knowledge. Proverbs 14a tells us the wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. So not only does he choose the right way, but he understands why he chooses it. Proverbs 22.3 tells us a prudent man foreseeth evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. You see, without prudence... A man rushes into decisions without considering the impact nor the implication of such decisions. It is interesting to note what Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8. 
He said this, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning, and the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. The patient in spirit is compared to the proud in spirit, as if we do things out of haste because of pride. While the patient in spirit is the opposite of that. So we find, ultimately, the man who is not prudent is the man, here it is, who is trusting in himself. He is so confident in himself that he does not need to give any more thought about a matter. And that's a foolish thing to do. You see, the whole idea of our text is the man who just goes, at, go, go, goes right ahead headlong and makes commitments here and there, and often he does so because of his pride, and often he does so because he is not a prudent man. Now let me illustrate if you would. Often a man, when he has a friend that comes to him and says, Hey, I need your help. And that friend will, be, will say, you know, I'll be glad to help you. But often they will do that because they want, don't want to upset their friendship. That's not the right reason. Because you're not motivated by the right. You're not motivated all of a sudden by what is right and what is wrong. You're only motivated because you want to preserve that relationship. So actually that motivation is pride. You make a decision not out of prudence. You make a decision or perhaps sometimes uh, you have uh, uh, people who try to shame others for not being helped by them. And if we succumb to that and bow and say, okay, well I've been shamed and I'll go ahead and make that decision, then you're not motivated by righteousness. You're not being prudent and you're being prideful because you are more interested in how you are being perceived than about righteousness. Now, I believe that principle can be applied to all of our lives, not just this one particular issue. So we find, again, the, cause, or the, the comprehension of caution, the cause of the caution. But thirdly, I want us to consider the consequences and the caution. Notice verse 2. He basically says, if you do this, this is what happens. Thou art snared. Now, notice he doesn't say, now you might be. He says, Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. You made a commitment. You spoke to your friend and says, I'll mortgage myself for you. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that note if you uh, fail to pay it. I'll be that man. And then I'll go ahead and strike hands with a stranger. The Bible says at that moment, Thou art snared with thy words. You didn't even realize what you did, but you just ensnared yourself. There's two words we find in verse number two, and that is the word snared and taken. The word snared means to be entrapped, to be bound. The word taken means to be caught, to be captured, to be holden. We know that we are not referring here to a physical entrapment or a physical capture. This is a uh, metaphorical in nature. He's talking a bit about what happens to us in our own hearts and in our own minds when we make such a commitment. We can be ensnared by our own words and taken by our own words. Now notice here uh, what the strange woman and the evil man does is something that they do to us and influence us. But here, this is something we do to ourselves. We bring harm to ourselves. We can be ensnared by our own words and, by, and taken by our own words. This is something that we say that causes us to be in, uh, in bondage. This is not a pleasant thing, by the way, to experience. I don't know if any of you have been in that position, but I've met people who've been in that position who co-sign for somebody, or a friend, or a family member, and then that friend or family member didn't pay, and then they were left to pay for it. That destroyed everyone in that relationship. Every time that friend or that family member didn't pay, it destroyed that relationship. Uh, by the way, and in a sense, as the Bible, and we'll see that later in the book of Proverbs, the Bible says the borrower is slave to the lender. In other words, when you uh, put money into a relationship, everything changes. If, it's at, it's at, if that's with the family, at the Thanksgiving dinner, uh, the, uh, the meal doesn't taste the same. The relationship is different. 
And so that's the consequences of the caution. But by the way, it's something that you've done to yourself by entering into such a commitment. So number one, we find, I promise you the rest of the message will be pretty uh, shorter in the points there. The caution on hasty commitments. But number two, we notice in verse number three, the counsel for healthy communion. And I'm talking about communion here in the context of friends. The Bible says in verse number three, so this is what you do. So he says, don't do this because this is what you'll do to yourself, but uh, do this in verse number three. Do this now. I like that emphasis. My son, and deliver thyself. When thou art come into the hand of thy friend, go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Now, I want you to notice several things about this council, really four things about this council we find in verse 3, and they're actually pretty specific. Number one, we see the urgency that is required. He says here in verse number 3, do this now. So in other words, if you've entered into that commitment, this is what you ought to do right now. In other words, something has changed because you've made yourself a surety for your friend. He could not pay the debt. And you said, well, you know, uh, give him some more time. If he can pay it, I'll pay it. And then you struck your hand with a stranger and you made a commitment with somebody you didn't know about. Well, you've ensnared yourself. Now, this is what you need to do right now. Don't delay. In other words, it seems that God knows exactly what to do. Because he says, do it now. There's no hesitation in that. We see the urgency that is required. He says in that in verse 3, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. So in other words, he basically said, the next time you meet your friend, you're going to do this. Now that's pretty specific. You know, sometimes we can be pretty general in the Bible and we can make a general application, but this is actually a specific application. If that is, that commitment with that friend, do this now. The next time you see him. So we find the urgency that is required. But number two, we find the honesty that is required. Notice the Bible says, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself. And so that requires honesty. Are we going to be honest? But here it is. Are we going to be honest with God and honest with ourselves? And recognize that the commitment we made perhaps was either done in, in pride or it was done with a lack of prudence? You see, we can't progress in our lives until we come to that moment where we recognize, I need to be delivered. Do this now. Deliver thyself. And that takes honesty. So we find urgency is required, honesty is required, but then third, thirdly, humility is required. Notice, uh, and this is so practical, this is unbelievable. Notice in verse number three, go humble thyself. That's the next step. Well, what does that mean? That means that when you go to your friend, you need to humble yourself and, says, and say, I was wrong, I shouldn't have done that. Now that's going to take humility. Because the truth is, not one of us like to admit when we do wrong. Not one of us like to admit when we did something that perhaps violated a principle from God's word. We don't like to admit it. But here God says, humble thyself. And he exactly knows what we need. The truth is, we're not going to get anything right until we humble ourselves and say, God, you're the authority and I'm going to submit under your authority. So the urgency is required, the honesty that is required, the humility that is required, but fourthly, the activity that is required. Notice at the end of verse 3, he says, uh, go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Now earlier he says, if you were a surety for thy friend, but now he says, make sure thy friend. Now there's divergent uh, opinions about what that mean, uh, but basically it basically means, uh, you know, after you deliver yourself, it means you deliver yourself from that commitment. So this is what this means. If you want to make sure your friend, and there's other biblical truth that helps us to give, to give understanding, the Bible makes it clear uh, that a brother should not uh, cause another, bro uh, another brother to be indebted to him. In other words, if you want to help someone, give them a gift. Don't say, hey, I'll give you this, you repay me. That's a biblical truth. Why? Because then the borrower is slave to the lender. You are ruining that relationship. Something is different now. Uh, whether it be with family members, whether it be with church members, whether it be with friends, at that moment when there's a transaction that takes place that is not a monetary gift but a loan or an indebtedness or you do something for me, if I do something for you, if you do something for me back, it ruins that relationship. It changes everything. 
And to make sure thy friend is basically to make sure to get, to get it right. And so I say, either you walk up to your friend and say, you pay the debt right now. Or you say, I'll pay the debt right now so we can get free from this. And that we don't have to worry about that anymore. A few years back, this is certainly personal to me. A few years back, I uh, got indebted to a few things. And I remember sharing that with my father. And my father, being the generous man he was, he said, well, I'll go ahead and give you this money. Now, his sentiment was, you don't have to give me anything back. But I can assure you, I paid every penny back. But he did not require or expected. But I can tell you, as long as that was in my heart and my mind, our relationship was affected. I, he was still my father. We still called. We still talked regularly. But something changed. And the moment I wrote a last check, in my estimation, from here was a gift, but in my estimation, I was indebted. When I wrote that last check, I felt freedom and liberty at that very moment. And I felt that, that our relationship was restored. Because things change. They, they, they do change when you uh, make uh, such a transaction. And so to make sure thy friend is to make sure that you encourage him to either pay his debt, to make things right, or you make things right so that you're not under this bondage any longer. So we see the caution, the counsel for this healthy communion. But thirdly, we see the concern with honorable conduct. And notice what he adds two verses in verse 4 and 5. He says this, Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Now, I know this verse is often quoted, and much, many times it's not quoted in that context. <laughs> but the context here is pretty clear. We're trying to make things right and restore relationship because we enter into commitment that we ought not to enter into the first place. He says, give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. And so one of the great tragedies in the lives of many people, in my life including, is the lack often of a concern for honorable conduct. Often people make a bad decision and they realize it. However, they often fail to spend the time to make things right. They are content with their mistake and they are content to live with the consequences of their choices. We make two conclusions in verse, five, for verse 4 and 5 about our concern with honorable conduct. And that is this. First of all, we must not be passive. That's basically what he says in verse 4. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Don't act like nothing happened. Brush it off. You've heard that truth, right? Isn't it what we often do with sometimes when we hear truth or a principle from God, and we may not necessarily like it? What's that? I'll just go, I'll sleep fine tonight. But really the principle is, remember, do this now. Isn't that what we should all pursue as Christians? When there is any conflict in any life, we should seek for immediate restitution and reconciliation and not delay it and not become passive and ask and like everything's okay. We are fine. We must, be con we must be concerned with the state of our mind. Because think about it here as he says, give not sleep to thine eyes nor slumber to thine eyelids. I think we all understand that when we cannot sleep is when we're troubled about something. Something is a turmoil in our heart. Uh, something is going on in our mind and we can't uh, be at rest until that uh, conflict is resolved, until that uh, issue is resolved. And so we can't sleep, we can't slumber. But when we get to that place where we sleep, it means that we're not giving any thought to it. While it ought to really consume us. Why? Because we ought to be concerned with honorable conduct. So we must not be passive, but secondly, we must be proactive. He says in verse 5, Deliver thyself, and he emphasizes those two words again. Deliver thyself, but here it is, uh, imagery, as a roe from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So not only do we must be concerned with the state of our mind, but number two, we must be concerned with the state of our will. See, I think that there's two steps we have to take. First of all, we have to let, let the truth of God bother us, consume us, 
because we want to be uh, con uh, uh, interested and concerned with righteous behavior. But then we have to do a second thing, and that is we have to, it's a matter of the way, we have to take action. Not only can we not be passive about it, but we must be proactive. So not only don't, uh, don't go to rest until this is settled, but then go ahead and deliver thyself, just as a roe from the hunter. In other words, there has to be an action, a matter of the will. And I'm going to tell you, any animal, a hunter knows that any animal that is entrapped in any type of trap will spend his entire energy. Uh, foxes will bite their whole legs off to get out of a trap. They are proactive. And there's a passion and a concern, what? For their life. They'll be willing to lose a limb so that their life is preserved from the hunter. Now, that's just laid out right here in the God's word. I'm not making this up. The truth is, I believe that God wants us to make decisions. I believe we can make those two conclusions. To make decision, not in haste, but to pause. To beware of making decision because of our pride or because of a lack of prudence. Now, we know particularly here it, it applies to debt, but I believe we could apply that to all of our lives and all the decisions that we make. And so may the Lord help us. Often we find ourselves in trouble by our own doing, our own decision. Often sometimes it could be we're doing something good, but it's not the right thing to do in the long run. And so may the Lord give us discernment. And, and, and it's good never to rush into a decision, particularly when it deals with a financial transaction. It is always important. And I'm not saying that this should never take place. I'm just saying this is what happens. This is the counsel of God. That we would pause, not do things because we want to be perceived a certain way by others, or because we have a lack of prudence in our decision making. Uh, the Lord will help us. And uh, I think we could add to this that we should never make a decision in our lives that we're troubled with. If the Holy Spirit is within us and we make decisions particularly of this nature, and if we do not have the peace of God, do not do it. If you do not have the peace of God, it is wrong. You're going to be troubled and you're going to continue to be troubled until you seek to rectify it now. And so may the Lord help us, give us wisdom in our day-to-day -day dealings that we would, would uh, seek again for righteousness. May that be what prompts us. And by the way, I think that what we could say in this chapter is that uh, what is requested of a friend, if you want to preserve your friendship, make sure thy friend, if you want to preserve that friendship, it would be good for you to tell him, I made a mistake. I should have no, never done this with you. I should have never mortgaged myself and made a pledge with a stranger on your behalf. Would you forgive me for doing that? And I want to rectify that right now. Because I'm more interested in me giving you money. I'm more interested in my, our friendship than I am in me giving you money. And then our friendship being ruined. You see, the friendship relationship will often be preserved when that is done than the friendship relationship that will often be ruined because of uh, such a transaction that took place. And so may the Lord help us.